So, uh, yes, I'm Chris Caswell, uh, Director of Reclaim Heritage, a community interest company, and uh, this is our project, Bowed Landscape Project. Um, at the start of last year, we're thrilled to join a project that feels like the first of its kind in the UK. Um, LIDAR has been in common use for years, but never before at the resolution and such a large area that this technology has brought to bear in the heritage sector. Naturally, there are particular challenges and rewards to working in such a novel way with such an unwieldy data set. What I present for you here today are some of the preliminary results of our findings, but also some discussion about how we've had to have been reflexive and pivot as the project's limitations require. The Valve Landscape Project is part of the five-year minor to major landscape project. It's supported by the Heritage Fund and designed to promote and safeguard the natural, built and cultural heritage of Sherwood Forest. We've been working in partnership with Nottinghamshire County Council and Forestry England and are currently about halfway through our study, uh, yet its significance is already quite apparent. So in 2020, a study was undertaken by Nottingham Trent University, which identified the need for a new high resolution survey of Sherwood Forest to explore archeological remains beneath the forest canopy, or indeed the veil. You can see here in blue, we have the outline of Sherwood Forest. So the following year in 2021, a 16 centimeter LIDAR survey of the entire project area, that's all of Sherwood Forest, was commissioned. And at the start of last year, Reclaim Heritage began working on processing and quantifying the data set. This was then followed by ground truthing events with local volunteers. Quite quickly, we realized that it simply wasn't realistic to cover the entire forest. It's a very large area. And instead, we focused on one small part of it, which is Sherwood Pines, outlined in red here. And that represents about 5% of the total forest. I'll do a quick background on Sherwood Pines itself. Um, the name itself is quite a recent addition um, because its pre 20th century name was known variously as Rufford Forest, Clipston Forest, or more commonly as Clipston Heath. In fact, by the end of the 19th century, there probably weren't many trees there at all just the occasional small plantation and covert within a large area of heathland. After the onset of the First World War, much of what we now consider to be Sherwood Pines was transformed into one of the largest training camps in the country, Clipston Camp, holding upwards of 30,000 troops at any one time, which, to put it in context, is about the same population as we're living in neighbouring Mansfield. Following the end of the war in 1925, um, the land came under the stewardship of Forestry England and was planted with pine trees to meet the demand for timber following the end of the First World War. And now it is a managed pine forest woodland, which also has quite a big tourist element to it, just to the northeast of the site. That's Sherwood Forest um, Centre Parks, uh, and there's some excellent uh, mountain bike trails through the forest, making, making the most of the impressive earthworks that are there. Now a little bit about the data, processing and digitization. The data was presented in 400 meter grid tiles as raw point cloud LAS files, and also as processed digital terrain models and surface models. The files were large. Each full point clouds tile was around a gigabyte, and depending on the vegetation cover, contained up to 41 million classified points. The DTMs were considerably smaller, but still held huge amounts of data. To process this, we used a variety of open source programs. Um, QGIS was used to manage and illustrate all map data, making good use of the relief visualization toolbox and the profile tool to enable cross sections and elevations through the point clouds. Point clouds were examined in much greater detail using cloud compare um, where points could be isolated, checked based on classification, 
segmented, subsampled, and processed to interpolate and mesh. All 3D visualizations were illustrated in Blender, making use of procedurally generated geometry nodes for handling the point data and image displacement to transform raster data into mesh objects. So, what does 16 centimeter LiDAR actually look like? Well, here we see two side by side images of the same 400 meter area. On the left, we have the Environment Agency 1 meter. DTM, which you can see some faint lines, um, certainly enough to warrant a trip out into the field. But on the right hand side here, we have this 16 centimeter resolution, which is absolutely stunning and crystal clear. In fact, there's hardly any comparison at all in some places, such as this network of practice trenches and shell craters. This is zoomed in a little bit. This is a 200 meter square. As we can see, the one meter DTM bears no resemblance whatsoever to this one, um, where it appears as if the trenches from the original one have been completely, well, classified incorrectly. Uh, interpreted at wall lines and interpolated out. So, processing the smaller subset of the overall data still proved to be challenging, as this represented 11 square kilometers as opposed to 214. Uh, first, the point cloud data was checked against the processed DTMs to make sure the data provided was an accurate reflection of the survey. This was done using a couple of tiles, but to be honest, the DTMs we received were excellent and ready to use. The DTMs were managed in QGIS and the Relief Visualization Toolbox, used to generate hill shades to aid in feature identification. After playing around a bit with the different available hill shades and settings that were around at the time, uh, we settled on the VAT method. That's visualization for archaeological topography. Those are three things that we're looking for. Um, and I think it quite nicely illustrates what we had. In, in our early testing, it produced very clear visualizations of features on the forest floor, more so than any of the directional or multi-directional hill shades available which I find can often result in poorly defined features depending on their orientation. You can see the multi-directional on the left side here, and you're really not getting the same definition on these features here because the light source is coming from a, a set direction going down it. Um, so, We processed it for the entire area, the entire site Sherwood Pines, um, but this was still a very large area. In our early testing, it produced very clear visualizations of features on the forest floor, more so than any of the directional or multi-directional hill shades available. Sorry. Once the hill shades had been processed and merged, all landscape features were mapped digitally in QGIS and saved as shapefiles and geo packages. We threw a 200 meter grid over the area and reproduced each grid square in its own recording form. This particular part of the forest hadn't been investigated before and the one meter DTM was found to be of limited interpretive value. As you can see, there's quite a lot going on, all of these black lines representing linear earthworks. And most of them relating to the First World War camp, Clipston camp that was here, but also on the eastern side here, some interesting earlier, we think, uh, rectilinear enclosures. So here's an example of the fieldwork recording forms. After we processed the data, I like going out with paper in the field. I print off each grid square with um, with the, the hill shade, um, and yeah, again, that's a 200 meter square, and there's just tons going on. Um, and you can 
pick any 200 meter square across Sherwood Pines and find extensive network of First World War trenches. Um, but not just that, it's also picking out um, much smaller features. You can see wheel rut marks going east to west across the northern part of most of this image. Um, that represents modern uh, forestry machinery track marks. Um, and yeah, it's really difficult to see that on the ground, really difficult. Um, but the level of detail is, is astonishing. However, what appeared so obvious on paper um, proved to be quite elusive on the ground, especially when confronted with waist-high brambles. Uh, it's worth noting that we conducted all ground truthing during the winter months, where it was hoped the vegetation would have died back. Um, however, it doesn't seem to in Sherwood Pines. In our trial run with the first group of volunteers, we found that we could realistically walk and record approximately two 200 meter grid squares per day through the brambles. It was, it was a nightmare. Um, not quite the progress we were hoping for. It represents a very small percentage of the total area of Sherwood Pines, and I'd estimated it would only take us another 140, 150 days of walking um, to do each grid. And we only had eight more sessions booked in. Uh, an executive decision was taken and the fieldwork strategy modified. Uh, a more targeted approach was required focusing on particular areas of interest. Um, this included previously unrecorded areas, a representative sample of each trench type, uh, and the rectilinear enclosures. more of a broad brush approach we were going for after experiencing it on the ground. It wasn't easy going though. Uh, this ditch and bank relating to one of the enclosures took a team of eight of us about half an hour to find on the forest floor after walking back and forth over it numerous times through the forest. Um, according to my digitized plans taken from the, the hill shades, uh, this feature should have extended for 80 metres, um, and yet this was the only small part of it that we felt confident enough to record photographically. Um, it's almost as if the LiDAR could see something that we couldn't. As I mentioned before, it was excellent mountain biking through the trenches and craters. So what did we achieve? Well, we're still working on that. Um, we ended up focusing mostly on the western part of Sherwood Pines, illustrated here. We use, um, it was in this area that the most extensive and dense concentrations of landscape features were found, and where the historic environment record was most in need of an update. So far, just in this area, we've mapped over 62 kilometres of linear earthworks. Um, which uh, are all in need of, of a bit of field work, going out and ground truthing. It's a huge, huge amount, and trying to go out there and walk all of this in some places just isn't possible. One of the biggest challenges we faced out in the field was finding a way to photograph and record the earthworks in a meaningful way. We used uh, one meter ranging rods uh, to mark tops and bottoms of all features with our trusty survey flags running between them to show the basic profiles. However, it wasn't always possible for a number of reasons to achieve this, particularly the larger features such as the rifle range, but seen here on the, I'm not sure you can see that on the right. Um, in fact, the photographs we took of the different constituent parts of the rifle range there were found to be less than informative, uh, particularly when we can now extract the elevation data from the point clouds and illustrate the complete profile through the forest floor wherever you want, which is what this is, generated using the profile tool in QGIS, taken straight from the LAS point clouds. 
and with such a detailed point cloud, we can pretty much extract whatever data we want and visualize it in whatever way best illustrates the point. If we really wanted to, we could experience the ground surface of the forest as a 3D model on a screen in virtual reality or printed as 3D feature boards signposted throughout the forest. So I want to talk a little bit about the limitations or things that we struggled with. Um, it's really the scale and size of the data set is the big one. Um, it's enormous and there's no way I'm going to be able to process it all. Um, thank you. Um, no way we can process it all. The size of it is quite unwieldy, really. Um, it's already burnt through one of my old gaming PCs. Uh, and uh, and this, this new laptop is struggling with it a little bit as well. Um, so I think really having, having a bit of a think about what we intend to use it for is, is quite important. Um, I should say it is freely available if people want to have a look at it. Uh, the National Library of Scotland have agreed to host it on their side-by-side -side viewer. You can go on there now and have a look at it for all of Sherwood Forest, that is. I think it's a multi-directional hill shape they've got on there. But it looks great, uh, and you can explore that data. It's also available from the HER in Nottingham. Um, also, some limitations that I noticed really in my own processing and my own kind of the way that I work through things and um, as I mentioned I started off with uh, the VAT method the VAT hillshade visualization archaeological topography those three words all seem to tick a box uh, so we went ahead with it and that's what we can see on the left side here but it was very different being out on the ground. I th you look at an image and you think, great, I know what I'm coming here for. Black and white are black lines, the trenches, and, uh, and that, you know, that's probably all we need to look at. There might be a few interesting bits on the southern, southern side here. Um, but processing it with different hill shades came with slightly different results, but I couldn't process everything in every single type of hillshade I wanted because you're just generating more and more data. Um, uh, something I think is well worth looking into, I mentioned earlier about hillshades at the time, well they've appeared to have recently added a new function, uh, multi-scale relief model, which is excellent. Um, and dark is deep and uh, low ground, white is high ground. I think that really nicely illustrates what's going on there and you can, that hasn't come out well at all, um, and you can combine and overlap and multiply these hill shades to extract whatever information you want to. So it's a visualization um, and it's whatever works, works for you. Um, and a small point here is some consideration of neuro neurodiversity. And um, by that I'm uh, not just referring to autism, ADHD. Um, with such data, I've been able to experiment with its presentation and was initially surprised by the visual visualizations people found the most naturally comprehensible. This one on the right, believe it or not, uh, seemed obviously clearest to me. Um, that makes sense in my brain. I, uh, I have a VAT hill shade and then I mess around a little bit and the low ground is blue and the high ground is red and that pops out and you get a nice bit of contrast and makes perfect sense to me. Um, but I found myself to be in the minority. Uh, my partner had a, a clearer interpretation from the one on the left here. Um, and uh, recent groups that I've been working with much preferred the, the usual VAT method. It seemed to be much clearer for them. Um, so 
what I mean about neurodiversity is how our brains read these visualizations is genuinely diverse. For me personally, this has been one of my most eye-opening elements of the project. So, to wrap things up, as I say, we're just starting, well, we're halfway through this project, but it feels like we've just scratched the surface of the area. It is an enormous data set, um, and I won't be able to do huge amounts with all of it. I do think there is a need for field work, um, for going out these ground truth and surveys. You can't beat seeing it with your own eyes putting the wider landscape into context with these much smaller sites that we identify and go and look at. So that's going to be a key component of what we're working on in the next year. Um, and then we need to start interpreting it. So at the moment, we've just been drawing lines on a map, going out, photographic survey. We haven't even really done any on the ground measured surveys. I'd like to go out and do that and do a comparison and see how that compares to the LiDAR data that we've got. Um, and possibly, if there's money in the budget, maybe some terrestrial laser scanning to compare the two. Um, 3D visualizations, I'm a bit of a geek, that's what I like messing around with. And uh, something that actually I discussed with Adam uh, last week was the use uh, or is the use of artificial intelligence, thinking of it potentially as an extension of our computer processing power. Um, this is an enormous data set that is really quite clear, and I think um, I think we should throw all the all the tools at it and see what we can can come out with. So that's that's me.